Today we're going to work on defensible space concepts and um, ember awareness. They kind of handshake together. I'll show you lots of examples so that you can go home and you're going to look at your house different by the time we're done tonight. Um, and we're going to have, I set aside at least half an hour for questions and answers. So we are talk about the concepts and then we can talk about lots of individual questions about your property. Okay, to get started, um, defensible space, first of all, it's an ordinance in our county. So you have to maintain defensible space, which is the 100 feet from your, basically your exterior wall out to either 100 feet or the property line around all the structures on your property. And there's different ways they can enforce it, including the fire department can come out and do inspections and citations and things like that. So we're here to be the carrot. We're here to encourage you to do it first, make it easy, explain how it works, do HIZ assessments if you have questions and you can't quite figure out what you want to do. Um, it makes a safe area to defend your home and it makes it safe for the firefighters to do so. The firefighters do not have to risk life and limb to protect the house. They, they do, obviously, we hear stories about it all the time, but they do triage when there's a fire, the same as you know, emergency room triage that you would think of. If they look at a house and it is not defensible, they drive to the next one. So the goal for you and for us in starting FireWise is they, you want to be the house they stop and take care of. You want your community and your road to be the house that, you know, there's only 25 engines. You want them to say, I know this is a FireWise community. I know it's defensible. And one of those 25 engines comes up your street. That's, that's. That's our ultimate goal. We want you to be defendable and your house to be defensible. So um, it reduces the fuel. We're going to talk a lot about fuels. So when I say fuels or hazardous fuels or vegetation management, I'm talking about everything that burns. Mostly it's the vegetation, but that's when, when a firefighter's talking about fuels or when I'm referring to fuels tonight, that's what we're talking about. Fuels is all the things that can catch on fire. And mostly we're referring to the natural vegetation when we say fuels. You know, some of you have propane tanks and there's other things that are hazardous ignition, you know, potential, but mostly when we say fuel, we're talking about vegetation. And it also helps keep the forest healthy. So fire ecology in this area, fire used to roll through. Slow, low ground fires, grass fires, it used to roll through this area every eight to 20 years, eight to 15 years burn out all the junk, burn out the leaves and the poison oak and that kind of stuff. But because it was such a low amount of fuel, it never got hot enough to get up into the canopies and do what they call these running fires. That's what happened in Big Basin. It doubled in size in seven hours because it got into the canopies and it just ran. So it engulfed in another almost 40,000 acres in seven hours one night. Because a canopy fire can't be fought from the ground. It can only be fought when they bring in the the uh, airplanes and the helicopters and stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about that kind of spacing as well so that you don't have that situation here. Um, but that's one of the ways that doing defensible space and doing vegetation management on your property, you're doing what those low, slow ground fires used to do because we don't want to let them burn. We live here. We like to live here. But the forest still needs all that stuff cleaned up. Otherwise, you have these 1,400 degree fires that, you know, can grow like crazy. We, this county had, in, in August, it had 400,000 acres burned. That has never happened before to our county. And it's because we've had all these decades of suppressing fires because we want to live there. So we're going to teach you how to do what fire ecology used to do before we moved in and turned it into our homes. Okay, immediately around your house, we call the, we nickname it the gray zone. It's the zero to five feet, so it's you know literally this much around your house. We don't want anything there. Before 2017 and Santa Rosa, they used to say you know low plants, brown cover, that kind of stuff. What we learned in Santa Rosa and in 2018 in Paradise, now the firefighters are saying nothing in the five foot around your house doesn't mean you have to make it super ugly. I mean, it, you know, there's lots of things you can do, um, but they don't want anything flammable. So this is where you're going to get creative with hardscapes, 
stepping stones, gravel mulches, broken pottery garden, boulders, bird baths, all those kinds of things that are made out of not plant material so that it won't burn when it gets put in a that, that's also your arches, the wisteria that's grown on the trellis that looks cool going over to your roof, those kind of things. All of that, if it, was, if it was their perfect world, they would have no vegetation in the five feet right up against your structure walls. So one of the things that I hear when I talk about that is people say, it'll be ugly when I look out the window. I don't want to live in a moonscape. But if you notice here is your windows. They've done, you know, this cool kind of gravel thing. These are a mix of the, that decking, what's that Trex deck that's made out of a synthetic, and some concrete, you know, things. When you look out these windows, you don't see this part. You're looking over that when you look out your windows. So you can protect your structure without really changing the view from your windows that much. Because that first five feet, when you're looking out a window that's already two or three or four feet off the ground, you're not going to notice it that much. The other benefit this has, especially up here, what that people are discovering is less bugs and less rodents in your house. Rodents love to bring in all their fluffy nesting stuff into your crawl space and into all that, you know, other areas under your deck and stuff. Well, that's like tinder to embers. So if you keep the critters out, that helps you too. So there's a couple benefits to this gray zone. All right. Any questions on the gray zone? Any ideas? We're going to have Q&A later. Grass, like hmm? grass, okay? It'll eventually burn. Grass will eventually burn if it's hot. So the 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 ideal is no, is nothing veg, you know, no no plant material. Okay, so our next zone is 5 to 30 feet. We've got our gray zone and our gravel and our stepping stones and you go out your, your front door, your side door. And then the next area is like your garden area. Maybe where your grass is, where your yard is. It's where your manicured things are. It's where most of your irrigated things are. Um, so if embers were to land near your house in that 30 foot zone, they're landing on things that won't really burn, right? And you wanna keep the hardscapes going. This is. This is an area where you want your vegetation pretty reduced. You don't want a lot of vegetation right up against your structures because eventually vegetation becomes preheated by the flame front and it will burn. It just takes longer if it's green and it's well kept. So you want to keep, if you put in, you know, pathways, gravel pathways, if you started with the, the boulder theme or something, you want to keep that flowing out into your 30 foot zone. So that it still looks nice, you can create a holistic look, but you've cut down the amount of vegetation. Think of vegetation as BTUs. How many BTUs do you want next to your house? Because that's what <clears throat> plants are, right? They're, they're storing all kinds of stuff. They're storing carbon, they're storing a lot of things, but they're also storing all this fuel. This is the house here, and you can see how it flows down from the house and just keeps going into this other zone. So you can, you know, make it look nice. The, the problem with this house in this picture, which I picked on purpose, is look at their five foot zone. Look who's living right there in their five foot zone. If that tree's on fire, do you think it's gonna catch this house on fire? These are open balconies right here. So this part of this part of it's a no-no, this part of it's working really well. He's got the low stuff, he's got, you know, a bunch of this open uh, things that won't burn, so even if this burned, it might not jump across. Back here, you, it's broken up on this grassy slope, but a whole bunch of stuff right against the structure. So we, this is something you wanna avoid. Okay. Vertical and horizontal spacing. These are absolutely key, and we'll talk about these more than once tonight, I'm sure. So vertical spacing is the spacing between what's grown on the ground and your tree canopy. So most plants, the rule of thumb for plants is the flame height is three times the plant height. So if you've got a two foot bush on the ground, you're gonna add six feet on top of it, you're gonna get flame height up to eight feet in the air. So what's there? Is it under a tree that'll burn? Is it under an eave or a gazebo or an umbrella? Or you know, what's, what's above that plant? And then as soon as you add anything that has a lot of oily content, like rosemary, you have to look at five times the height of the plant. So
So you want to have a critical eye when you're looking at your property of how you're going to break things up. That's your vertical spacing. Imagine that what's underneath has caught on fire and the flames are three to five times the height of that plant. What's the flame going to touch? What's the next thing it can catch on fire? Um, so that's here. So the main solution to this for most people is to trim what's on the ground shorter and limb up the trees. So limbing up the trees is, you can see on this one here on our left, that lower limb's been cut off. That's a perfect example of what you're going to do. You're going to cut off the lower things. Um, so if there was ground cover or low bushes under this and they were on fire, they wouldn't necessarily get into the canopy of the oak tree. So you raise the ceiling on everything. That also helps the health of the tree because oaks suffer a lot in the drought. And those are the, tr those are the, the branches that get the least amount of sun least amount of photosynthesis, they tend to die underneath without sun. So if you're cutting off the half dead branches anyway, the tree is not spending as much energy trying to keep those branches alive and keep those branches healthy. So you're helping your defensible space, you're reducing the amount of fuel that's up like, near your property, and you're helping the health of the tree. Okay. So that's what this is talking about right here, this ladder. This little guy caught on fire and it's so close to the tree next to it that it's caught the next tree on fire and then it's caught this one. So this is now in a position to become a running crown fire because the fire trucks, unless this is a really small conifer, the fire trucks are not going to be able to get up here. They're going to need to drop things from the top. Um, horizontal distance. That's the, the distance, you know, running along the ground between things. So. You, this one, unfortunately, you'll hear different things, um, different recommendations on the horizontal distance. Most of what I've seen is stuff that's, you know, shorter, like maybe person size or less, is three to five, three to six feet between the plants. Because if you can imagine one on fire, spitting sparks or whatever, you know, think of what, how far they would go. Sparks jump out of a campfire or something. You, you can picture how that would be. Um, keep the dead portions cleaned up. This is critical. If it were to jump on, if a spark were to jump onto something that's alive, it would take a long time for it to burn. It might self-extinguish. If it lands in leaf debris or pine needle debris, or you know dead sticks and things that have fallen down, it's going to be a lot more likely to catch on fire. So, when you see stuff on the ground, think of it as tinder and kindling, and do you want it there? Or do you want to clean it up? Okay. So we call the thirty, the five to thirty foot zone, the lean, clean, lean, clean, and green zone. Say that three times back. <laughs> um, they've done a pretty good job here. You've got low things. You can use a little more spacing in between, but it's broken up. You know, this could this could have grown a lot thicker. So you've got about fifty percent of the fuel that if this was solid, if it was planted solid. You've got some hardscapes here that might break things up. This is where that staircase was with the railroad ties. And up here, up against the house, in their gray zone, their zero to five, it's a cement patio. So they've, they've found a way to make the where the sparks would land next to a house. There's no vegetation there. There's no tinder and kindling. Okay. These are a little close. You know, we're always going to pick on people for their spacing out their trees, but... Okay, the next zone um, is 30 to 100 foot. So we've got the gray zone, the green zone, and now we're doing the extended area, the 30 to 100 feet. This one is where the spacing is really critical because this isn't typically where you irrigate. This isn't typically where you garden. And up here, you may have started to change slope by the time you get 30 feet out from your house because you guys are in the hills. It's really cool. So this is our, we call it the extended zone. And then this one you won't hear much at all, the downslope extended zone. So I'm just going to touch briefly on it. Basically, fire safe councils come up with this concept loosely based on information that we've been given by the fire agencies because most places aren't quite as hilly as we are. And what they're noticing in some places is even the 100 feet on a steep slope isn't enough cleanup. 
So we're starting to recommend this even a fourth zone that is generally cleaned up. So it doesn't burn as hot, even if it were to burn here, and then the embers would get cast into your extended zone. But this one, you're not gonna see it on all the brochures. You're gonna have to come look on my website for it. So it's based on really recent experience. We haven't coined the term anywhere, but it's an important concept, especially the more slope you have. Okay, the extended zone. We don't want you to make a moonscape. You don't have to live in a moonscape. You didn't come up into the hills to live in a moonscape. We call it, its nickname is a park-like setting. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see you've got stuff on the ground. The critters are living, the lizards are living, you know, they're happy, you, you've got the, that kind of thing. And then you've got your nice canopy up here to maintain your shade. But between the things that are on the ground and the canopy, you've got space. That's that park-like setting they're talking about. Like you could see across it as a park, think of a park with grass and trees kind of thing. So that's that gap that you're, that you're looking for that breaks things up. Yeah. And I want to look a little bit more on slope. Slope is really important where you guys are. So we recommend 10 feet between them when it's flat for a gentle slope, 10 feet between the trees. As soon as you have 20 feet, a moderate slope, we want you to do 20 feet between the trees. So if you imagine that two trees are side by side and they're burning, they're gonna burn pretty much straight up until you know we get into a, the fire weather and that kind of stuff, which does make things more extreme and changes the rules. Um, but if you can imagine two feet, two trees 10 feet apart that are on a hill, the top of this tree is burning, it's really easy to get to the top of the next tree, especially if this tree falls. So the, the taller, the, the steeper the slope is, the further apart the trees need to be. So that this tree can't affect this tree. Does that kind of make sense? So that's what this picture is here. These two trees are 20 feet apart because it's now we're starting down the hill, right? Here we're even further down the hill. We've separated the trees by 30 feet instead. So. These graphics are on my website. There's books and things on my website. There's brochures on my website. Dave also has some of them. I don't know if he's put them out on your website, but we've got lots of material that helps you figure out what slope you are, how far apart the recommendations are, things like that. And this slide for the show is going to also end up on the website. So the reference page at the end and stuff. So you'll have multiple places you can find this information. All right, digging more into slope. Here's the two times rule. So if it's two feet high, they want four feet in between them, and then 10 feet between the big tall trees. So this is a mild slope. And you can see here, they want four times between them. So this is Cal Fire data. That's where this comes from. So they fought a few fires, they kind of know. <laughs> So here's your, you know, if it's two feet here, they want eight feet between them. And then this is what I was talking about. If this tree is burning and it burns up to the top, you can see it's close to the mid ground of this tree. So they want 20 feet between them as soon as your slope gets moderate. And then it's even more extreme here, six times and 30 feet. So you guys are in a lot of this uh, steep slope area here. <laughs> Now we're going to change gears a little bit because I want you to start to think like your campfire. And we're going to talk about embers and firebrands, fancy words for sparks. Um, they can, so here's your, you know, it's coming down the hill. It's already at the top. Fire burns up, right? No. Fire, when it burns, it preheats everything that's in front of it. Like you would put a wet log on the edge of a campfire in order to use it next. Fire does the same thing for itself. It's burning here, flame front's coming through, it's preheating all the fuel in front of it, drying it out, preheating it, warming it up. So that's the next place it's gonna go. The other thing fire does is it throws off embers and fire brands, which are all the sparks that jump forward in front of it. So if you can imagine, did you guys get ash fall here from the? Okay, so if you were a little bit closer to 35, some of that would have been lit. It wouldn't have been ash by the time it fell. So you can imagine how far that those things can get carried. Santa Rosa was an extreme example because it was almost 100 degrees and the gusts of wind were up to 60 miles an hour and more in some places. Five 
miles, the embers were still lit on the wind. So ember cast is a super important concept. A lot of forest fires or wildfires spread by ember cast. All that preheated fuel in front of the flame front and it's throwing embers on it. Now those are spot fires catch on fire and it preheats the next layer of fuel. And that's why you get those ring shaped fires that I had on the very first slide. That's the flame front preheating the fuel and it just burns to the next one. And behind it, it's burned up all the fuel. So you have this black interior and that ring just spreads. So what I want to do is teach you guys to look at your house with a critical eye and say where the embers are going to be a problem and where they would self-extinguish. Um, okay. Where would it land? This is the home ignition zone. This is that HIZ assessment that we come out and do for folks. You're going to be baby home, assist, home ignition zone assessors by the time we're done tonight. So, where do you guys clean the leaves off your property? I think, where do you, when you're having to tell the gardener to go take care of it, or you're out there sweeping the deck yourself, just imagine where the places are that the leaves collect on your individual houses. That's where the embers are going to collect. Same wind behavior, same catcher's glove behavior kind of thing. So wherever you're sweeping up your pine needles and your leaves, that's where the embers are going to go. So along your skylights, along your dormers, any, sh any shingles and things that catch, if there's something that's not quite repaired or something's curled or the wind has damaged something, gutters. Who's ever driven past a house and there's grass growing out of the gutter? <laughs> Never happened, right? Come on. You guys out there? <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, big one. Keep those gutters clear. And I know it's hard up here. I, I know that that's a tough maintenance thing, but it's really important. Um, under the steps, up against the, you know, the deck, especially if there's a space between your step and your deck, they go right under there, right? Well, the embers are going to go right under there, too, and they're going to find all sorts of dead oak leaves under there, and they're going to be happy little embers that are now a fire. So... Um, fences, wood piles, stuff that can be too close to your house. Who leaves their car windows open? Anybody? Good. There's other places in the country that leave the car windows open. Car win open car windows? What's the upholstery made out of? What's it treated with? Petroleum products. Leather cleaner, oils, foam, all that stuff. Cars are a terrible thing to leave your car windows open. So that's what this is over here. Uh, recycle bins, keep them closed. So, here's my house, my garage actually. How many things can you see in that picture that would be a problem? Yep. Well, it's actually a deciduous tree, but it does look dead. You're the first person that said that, so that's good. Um, and what's going on here? Wires. Yeah, those are the power lines. So this was before PG&E PG came out. They come out to my house every other year, chop everything back and leave it laying all over the place. But um, rather, This is only one day after we cleaned the garage roof. That's how much tree, leaf falls in the, in the fall, right? Because these are deciduous. So, And here's my gutter with stuff, you know, back in it again. So, and here's, <clears throat> we're getting our house painted, but you can see if you're close enough how the end of the end of the, the soffit and the wood trim is peeled. The paint is peeled and things can lodge in there and it can get in there behind the wood trim and up against the uh, shingles. So there are all those little weird pockets. That's a, those are potential problems. So painters are at my house right now taking care of this. Here's that zero to five zone that we were talking about earlier. Embers come in, they hit the walls of your house, they drop down, and if it's a little bit warm, you get this tumbling effect, kind of like a hurricane flipped on its edge. Tumbles in there, and all of it, all these embers drop down, and what are they going to land on at your house? When you, want, when you go back into your house tonight, this is the question I want you to ask. If the embers come in, and they tumble down, and they drop to the ground right against your house, what are they going to catch on fire? Or are they going to go out? Next question, if this is on fire, what's up above it? Do you have a porch? Do you have an eave? Do you have an awning? What's up above it if this is burning? 
because potentially this could go out if it was just grasses or low ground cover, if the house is resilient enough. Siding lasts about 40 minutes, even with the flame right up against it. So potentially this could go out if it's not a fuel that's gonna get hotter and there's nothing else to catch on fire. Here's that gutter problem we talked about, right? The debris on the roof. Gutters don't last very long. They last less long, especially the um, non-metal gutters, the nylon and the plastic gutters and stuff. So now you've got a petroleum product burning on your house right next to the eaves where the roof, you know. So these are. that's why you want to keep your gutters clean. Here's another picture. What do you see in this picture of where things would land? Yeah, on the deck. This deck's nice and clear though. Cleaned up, the paint's in good condition, it's not splintered. So that's that's a really good start because we love wood decks. Wood decks in and of themselves aren't necessarily a fire hazard. Think if you tried to, to light a two by four on fire with the match. Probably not gonna catch, right? You don't have the tinder, you don't have the kindling. So keep your decks in good condition because the embers, if they get caught in a splintered end or the decks are starting to peel and you haven't treated it lately, that's where a deck can become part of the fire problem. There's a lot of other things that are gonna catch on fire before a well cared for wood deck. Um, here's the underneath, right, that we talked about. But this one's pretty cleaned up and it's up on cinder blocks. So they came in and they burned, but did they get to his house? It went out, out here, because this stuff's too hard for it to keep burning. And it doesn't have a coconut doormat. Those coconut hair doormats, they'd be really great getting all the dirt off your shoes and they burn like crazy. That's the first thing the fire department does when it comes to look at your house and triage your house. They will do a little bit of defensible space. They call it giving your house a haircut because they just sweep in and do it really fast and you get what you get. <laughs> Door, doormats are the first, some of the first things that they throw. They just take them and they throw them. They throw them downhill, they throw them out in the driveway um, and chairs. All, any kind of fabric chairs, the same thing. All of it, they just throw it as far away as they can from the houses. So this one worked. I mean, his deck's burnt, but his house isn't. This, was, this is what you want. You want it to go out when the embers land there instead of catching on fire, burning hotter, burning the next part. This is a fence. This fence doesn't obey the rules of the zero to five it's wood right up to the structure of the house. They call it a wick. The fence is burned right up, and a lot of times your fence comes to the side of your house, and the eaves are over your pedestrian gate or whatever, so that burns right up to it. So really think about your fences in your zero to five, in your gray zone. Consider changing pedestrian gates to metal gates or wrought iron gates so that you've broken up the continuity of that wick from the, that's going to be in the edge of your yard out in the 100 foot zone or the 30 foot zone and the wick that fire right up to your structure. So. Okay. Houses have to breathe. That's how they stay dry, keeps the mold out, etc. It's how, it's how they're built. It's what we need. These are some of the kinds of vents. But if you're an ember, does this look like a good place to live? How about this one? Or this one? Yeah, so these all need change to eighth inch screen. The building code is still quarter inch screen and after Santa Rosa, we know better. It needs to be eighth inch metal screen. This is a really easy, inexpensive thing you can do. They found houses burned from the inside out in, in Santa Rosa especially, but also in Col the Col big Colorado fires and other fires because the ember gets in here, drops into your attic, What's in your attic? Who's got boxes of Christmas decorations in their attic? <laughs> Who's got the baby clothes still in the attic? You can cardboard boxes. What else is in your attic? Is it flammable? Can I drop embers on it? So you need to really help your house be the first layer of defense and put that eighth inch screen in there. Uh, and these are all the kinds of vents of where it could blow in. Cheap, easy, super important. Hey, look at that. It's fancy. I didn't make this slide. <laughs> okay, here's our skylights. Who's got acrylic skylights? Better not see any hands up. Okay, good. Who's got double paint skylights? All right, good job. 
So we want tempered glass on the skylights. We want double pane wherever possible. Um, and you got to keep them cleaned up. Here's the, you know, keep the shingles in good condition, the flashing in good condition. If the flashing has started to lift off the edge of your skylight, that's, that's a little V right in there where those numbers are going to land right in there. So you want your flashing to be in good condition too. Um, chimneys, spark arresters, same thing. The building codes have not caught up with what we know, our fire experience. You want to check your spark arrestor for smaller holes in the screen. Because embers can go down, just like the smoke will come out. <laughs> so, um, and you want to make sure that the trees that um, are around the property are at least 10 feet from your chimney. At least 10 feet. The same rule as the, ten, the trees that are 10 feet apart on the flat areas, right? Okay. Windows. Here's the big difference between double pane and single pane and tempered and non-tempered. Radiant heat can break non-tempered glass. So the fire doesn't even have to be to your house yet. The heat in front of the flame front, remember we talked about preheating the fuels? It's going to preheat the side of your house too. Non-tempered glass will crack and break. Now your window's open to all those embers that are flying around. So that's the first thing. You want tempered glass. It's also much safer. If a bird were to hit your window, if somebody were to throw something in the house, you were to trip and hit into a window, you want tempered glass. It's stronger, it's less dangerous for a lot of reasons. Then the next thing is two, dual pane, two panes. Because the radiant energy comes in here, it comes up against that outside piece of tempered glass. Even if this one breaks, this one is still intact. So you have your window's not open to the embers if you have two and one breaks. Um, and you can, that's what happened right here. This outside window broke and the piece of glass there is still there. And this house didn't burn, even though you had to replace windows. So the tempered bug, it's a tempered glass is a pattern. So you look for the tempered bug and you'll know that you've got tempered. It's a little, looks like a little ladybug kind of, a kind of a little beetle. Shutters. I'm sorry to give you the bad news. Embers get caught in shutters. I know. We don't live in her in hurricane season. You don't need to throw the shutters across the glass to protect yourself from a tornado or a hurricane, but embers love shutters. There's not a lot of solutions for this. If they're kept in better shape and they're kept debris free, a little bit less likely to, to burn, but they're just they're just everything. You catch things. You know, they're hard to maintain, they're, they have spider webs in them, they're, they're, just, they're just tough, so be aware of them, if you have them, decide what, you know, you're going to use it, what you're going to allow as your risk to your house, but shutters are tough. And what's this here? What's, what? There's that fence we were talking about, it runs right up to his shutters, and if the fence was on fire, there's the eave. So now he's got his shutters and his fence on fire right under his eave. And look at this vegetation, right up against the front porch, and there's a nice wicker chair, painted wicker chair. How fast do you think that's going to burn? Pretty quick. Okay. Now I've completely ruined your front porch <laughs> and your shutters, and you had to cut everything down and put in these boring old stepping stones. We're going to talk about what's under your house, <laughs> what's under your deck. <laughs> So there's the foundation vent back there, and this is your crawl space. So this is a good idea of if the embers blew in here, what's under here that will catch on fire? Well, this one looks great, right? There's nothing under here. So the other thing the screening does is it keeps stuff out. It keeps rodents from dragging in nesting material. It keeps leaves out. So the, the eighth inch screen is good for more than one thing. Here it is from the outside. This is actually an example of what's called a Vulcan vent. They're about 12 bucks. You can order them from Home Depot and other hardware stores. And they have a, a foam inside them that when it reaches a certain temperature, the foam expands and closes it completely. So, you know, you can't obviously leave your whole foundation closed up all the time because then it's not doing, the vents aren't doing their job when you're getting mildew problems and moisture and other things, but those Vulcan vents, when they reach a certain temperature, it's a gray foam and it just, I can't, I'm not sure 
what analogy I have, but you can kind of imagine how it would just foam itself shut. And so then the embers can't get in at all. This is another type of vent. Um, this is really popular on the dryer vents. It's louvered. So if the dryer is pushing air out, the louvers will lift. And then as soon as there's no pressure, the louvers drop down again. So it's already closed. Your dryer vents aren't a source of being open. Here's what I was talking about with the embers got in the attic. Forest isn't on fire. Trees aren't burning. Only the house is burning. This is not super unusual. Sometimes it's the house that burns and not the forest. Because the embers have landed on the roof or they've dropped into the attic and it's burning the structure. Because there's more good stuff to burn in this house than there was in these green trees. So. All right, now we're gonna pick on the neighbors. If this is your house, I'm sorry. Just pretend, don't tell anybody. Um, what's going on here? Tell me some of the things you see. Come on, you're mini inspectors now. Tell me what you got. What's going on here? Trees over the roof. Trees over the roof. What else is on this roof? Leaves. Yeah, in the gutter, it's got leaves and all sorts of good stuff in the gutter. How about here? This is my gray zone. I see vegetation in the gray zone. Okay, but pedestrian gate, it's made out of metal, it's wrought iron. His fence isn't wicking up to the house. I keep saying him, sorry. Um, so a little bit of work's been done here. We've cut back some of the branches and things, but this over the top of the house is still a risk, especially with all the debris it's producing all the time. Um, Same thing. Just, I'm just picking on you. It's nothing personal. Ah, whoops. So here we have trees are touching the roof, right? If this tree were burning, this roof would be burning. Um, this area kept clean, really kept clean because you can imagine the embers falling in here. And, you know, here's a window. Here's a place where they could get caught. Here's an eaves above it. So you definitely want to keep that really cleaned up. This looks good here. You know, you've got some rocks and that gray zone is starting here. We don't have flammable furniture. We've got a piece of metal furniture, so that's good. This one's going to burn like crazy, that piece of wicker. And this is right up against the house. So some things that need fixed and some things that are already done really well. Um, this kind of stuff is good too in your gray zone. Because it adds a little depth and dimension, and, but it's not going to catch on fire. This is closed up. Anybody have outside outlets that don't have covers on them? So we've got a cover on this outside outlet, so that's good. Oops. And I'm pretty sure that these are double pane windows. Sorry, two buttons are too close together. I'm pretty sure these are all double panes, just by the fact that you can see the white in between the panes. So we've got some good double pane glass there. All right, cruising around the backside. Or it might be a different now. Um, what is going on up here? It's covered in trees. So this is a tough one because I'm sure whoever's house is, is loves that oak tree. So these are tough decisions. Sometimes you're going to be making tough decisions to cut back enough to have this house have that 10 foot trees off. It's, it's a tough choice. Um, again, we've got the rocks and things here. It looks pretty good. We could get rid of some of this grass. Double pane windows around again. Here you've got the railing is not made out of wood, so you're working with something that won't burn. It's attached to the house, so that's good. Um, the main thing in this picture is how close the trees are to the, to the roof line. And here's me. <laughs> <laughs> and my cards are over there, and now I'll take all the questions you have. Thank you.